Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Monticello live stream. Today, we're going to have me, Derek Wheeler, part of the research, research archaeologist here at Monticello, and... And I'm Crystal O'Connor. I'm the archaeological field research manager, so I run all of the field work here. And today, we're going to be talking to you about some recent research that we've done this year. Uh, the first one is going to be something that's near and dear to my heart. I spoke about this last year on the live stream. Uh, feel free to check it out. It's on the road system at Monticello, how it evolved through time. And today um, we're gonna be looking at one specific aspect of that road system. And this is the road that connected the west end of Mulberry Row to the North Spring on the north side of the mountain. This was a very important water source. And it was, uh, however, it's 250 feet below the top of the mountain where uh, people along Mulberry Row and in the mansion house live. And so it was not an easy trek to get down to and to haul water back up to the mountaintop. So uh, today, if we go to the next slide, we can see, we will see uh, where the North Spring is sitting today. It's, uh, it's not very dramatic today. There's not a lot of water coming out of this spring anymore. But during Jefferson's day, it was the most important water source for the inhabitants of Mulberry Row and the Mansion House. Uh, water, Jefferson, water was always a very uh, near and dear problem to Jefferson. It was all, and the inhabitants, they did live on top of a mountain. And so, getting water to the top of the mountain was extremely difficult. Jefferson had a well dug extremely early in his tenure at Monticello. Uh, it went down over 80 feet before they found any water. Uh, even though it was dug so deep, uh, there was many years that the well went dry. And so uh, periodically, not, not continuously, but periodically went dry. So the water had to be hauled up from this north spring. And if, the cisterns also leaked. Oh, um, yes. Jefferson had cisterns built. He tried many different methods to retain water uh, up near the house, but uh, it wasn't until the very near end of his life that they found a way to uh, store water in the cisterns that wouldn't leak out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we go to the next slide, we, uh, where we are working today is we're not on the north side of the mountain. In this particular graphic, the north is up. So the North Spring was up and beyond off the image of the mansion house. But we are, uh, as I mentioned, at the west end of Mulberry Row, where the beginning of, of, of a road went down to the North Spring. And you can see uh, where I've marked out the area of excavation. This is where our investigation uh, took place. And the question is, why? Why are we here? If we go to the next slide. Uh, here is a very early map. Uh, in, in my mind, it's one of the earliest maps Jefferson draws of Monticello. And uh, it's somewhat schematic. The part that's on the bottom the, to the south on the lower end, that's a very well-drawn, executed drawing of what was Jefferson's Park. It was surveyed in the 1770s, and that's very well-placed. The house in the middle uh, is also well placed, but the rest of the map is fairly schematic. However, if we go to the next slide, we can throw some labels on here. And we can see the, I have Mulberry Row marked as well as the mansion house, as well as highlighted this route that connected the west end of Mulberry Row, traveled uh, around the mountain to the North Spring, and then one could continue, follow the road to the uh, east end of Mulberry Row where the stables were. So it was more of a circular road as opposed to going down, turning around and coming back up. So this is a very early map. And then if we see our next map, this is a map that was uh, made in 1803 and it shows uh, the same road system. However, there has been some changes. And if we see the next slide, we get, uh, once again, I have Mulberry Row a label as well as the mansion house. And I think if we go one more slide, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I have, oops, there we go. We have uh, marked out the route that went down to the North Spring. After Jefferson had the wings of the mansion house built, one could, he had another road built that connected the North Wing, the North side of the house. Uh, and it went, the road went straight down the mountain to the North Spring. But you could you see that one then had to uh, then come up 
uh, what Jefferson has now called a one in 10 connector road, connecting uh, Mulberry Row with that North Spring as well. So one could travel either way to get to the North Spring to and, bring water up. And one in 10 meant? Yes, that's a great question. One in 10, Jefferson also had roads called one in 20s. And this simply referred to the slope. One in 10 was for every 10 feet traveled, one either went uphill or downhill a foot in elevation. One in 20, you traveled 20 feet before you went up or down a foot in elevation. So the one in 20s were more gentle, uh, gentler slope. Uh, the one in 10s more steeper. And basically the, the steeper the road, the steeper roads were meant more service roads. So i.e. getting water whereas the less steep roads were more the, part of the ornamental landscape that surrounded Monticello. All right, so let's go to the next image. And here is a map that was made, produced from LIDAR data. LIDAR is uh, a way of getting very detailed topographic um, uh, information by flying planes over an area and they shoot lasers down and the light is reflected back up and one is able to uh, get points from the ground. And here what we have is what is typically called a hillshade of the resulting digital elevation model. And this is simply having the computer shine a light from the top left corner down across to the bottom right corner. And so you see the light shining on the north side of the mountain, which is in the upper left, and it's darker on the bottom and right because that's the mountain. The mountaintop is hiding. Uh, or shading the light uh, is not as much light as getting down there. And you can, hopefully you all can see little lines traversing the landscape, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to the next image. And here I have taken that second Jefferson map, the one that, had, that was made after the wings were constructed, and I overlaid it on top of this uh, digital uh, hillshade map. And so we see where the road should be based off Jefferson's maps. And this map is actually pretty accurate. Uh, one can just simply take two points on this map and register it to the modern landscape. And it fits very well. Uh, uh, one, uh, if you zoom in, if one zoomed in, you might be able to see that the Jefferson roads, which are the black, dark black lines, don't quite match up with the hillshade lines that are that lighter color. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a very accurate map. However, so if we go to the next image, here we are zooming in on the area in question. And I have the, uh, the one in 10 connector road labeled. And you can see it very well, the, the top arrow from the label, the top arrow is pointing to part of that one in 10 road and it really pops out and one can see it. However, that right arrow, it's kind of it's kind of fuzzy and it soon disappears uh, as you move further and further to, to the right of that arrow. And that's part of the reason why we're doing this investigation. However, we have found that if you, I mentioned that the computer, you tell the computer where to shine a light to produce this hillshade map. If you tell it to shine instead of from the top left corner to the top right corner, as we see in this next image, we can see the the road really starts to appear very well on that right arrow. But however, it soon, once again, quickly disappears. And where it disappears is exactly where we enter, leave the forest areas of Monticello today and go into an open field. So once you get into that open field, the road trace completely disappears. So our investigation is to see where exactly what we are hoping to find is exactly where that road went through this open field. So let's go to the next slide. Derek, what um, computer program were you using to generate that imagery? Uh, I was using ArcGIS Pro, uh, but uh, there are, this is a program that you have to get a license to run, but there are many free software packages that one can get to uh, run run, do this hillshade as well. And in fact, I should give a plug to the, uh, uh, is it the USDA? I forget, uh, or USGS, but uh, the government has provided funds for counties to have these LIDAR studies made. And so this is data that's freely available and anyone can produce these kind of hillshades themselves. I like on those hillshades, you can really see um, the roads connecting not only 
the end of Mulberry Row to the North Spring, but to the other roundabouts themselves. And just thinking about Jefferson's plan for the landscape and him bringing back all the ideas from from Europe and um, having you know the the enslaved labor force to actually implement these design ideas, it just sort of required um, a lot of a lot of work. Absolutely. So. Um, yeah, well, I'd be happy to talk about um, the excavations and what we found um, and what we found out um, and what we didn't find. Um, so we spent about two months or about a month and a half um, at the end of Mulberry Row in that open field like Derek was describing. So if you're walking down Mulberry Row and heading down the brick path towards Jefferson's grave, you would have seen us on the right hand side. Um, we had a team of four field technicians, archaeological field technicians out there. So these are all um, uh, archaeologists who have their degrees in the field and who have spent some time excavating um, both, both regionally and, and nationally and internationally in some cases. Um, so you can see on, um, on this next slide some photos of us doing that work. Um, we dug three trenches, um, so one along that wood line where we could see uh, the road in the woods, but again, in the field, it was gone. Um, so Derek had taken that and uh, one of those plats that Jefferson drew in 1809, registered it to the modern landscape. And um, one of the first trenches we dug was along that wood line. Um, you can see that these are very regular. We dig in five foot by five foot uh, test squares. So trench number one just has a bunch of five foot test squares tacked onto one another. So there's four there. Uh, then we dug an intermediary trench um, sort of halfway up the hill. Um, we saw an odd bump on the landscape. Um, one of our geoarchaeology friends, Dan Hayes, came and sort of looked at the site and thought it might be a good idea to put some test squares in the middle there. So we dug two, um, uh, two, uh, two and a half by five foot squares. So it's kind of a long rectangular shape. Um, and the next slide shows the final trench that we dug um, closer to, to Mulberry Row in the fourth roundabout. Um, and there were several test squares that we dug here. Um, and, um, and yeah, so we didn't end up finding evidence of the road. Um, we think that subsequent plowing um, would have likely plowed away any evidence of the road. Um, we, what we were looking for specifically were, were features in the form of wheel ruts. Um, or a cut that enslaved laborers would have cut into the to the soil to to um, provide a flat a flat uh, surface on which carts and wagons and enslaved work workers would have carried buckets down to the North Spring, um, and we also were you know keeping an eye out for uh, a different surface. So we didn't know if the surface was going to be prepared with rocks, um, but we didn't find evidence of any of that. So we think that subsequent plowing, perhaps after. Monticello was sold out of the Jefferson family, um, just took away any evidence of it in the form of plowing or erosion. Um, we did find we did find out some cool things though. Um, next slide. So we found two um, two features that we are associating with trees. Um, and next slide shows the outlines of them a little bit better. We have. Um, a lot of iron in our uh, soil here at Monticello, which results in red clay, um, and uh, it never comes out of your clothes ever, um, but it makes hard to see things in the dirt. So we've outlined uh, the planting features in white here. Um, so the lower right, you can see um, Damien, one of the archeologists with an excavated planting feature. What we were looking for, what we saw when we found this feature was um, a darker color sediment in the fill of, or in, in the hole that probably an enslaved worker dug um, into which they would have put probably a, um, a tree ball for a sapling, for a tree sapling. Um, we know that Jefferson had lined, um, we know that enslaved workers lined different pathways and walkways at Monticello. Um, with trees. So, um, for instance, Mulberry Row is lined with trees on either side. Part of the first roundabout was lined with um, locusts, right? Honey locusts? Honey locusts, Honey yes. locusts. Um, so it wouldn't have been uncommon for perhaps a path down to the North Spring um, on this one in, 20, 1 in 10 road to have been lined with, with, a tr with trees. So we only found one of those planting features. Um, so we took all of the dirt from that hole, we, um, we collected it and we put it into flotation bags and 
later this summer, we will um, use a process by which the dirt will get floated. Um, and we will be looking for small things like seeds, um, charcoal, rem charcoal remains, buttons, uh, small pieces of ceramics that might help us learn where that dirt came from. Um, so that dirt looked different, it felt different. Um, and we can very clearly see it in the ground. Um, the top left photo shows, a, uh, shows an image Lizzie is with um, what we're calling a tree hole. So we think this was actually a naturally occurring tree. Um, it looked different than the one in the lower right where Damien is. It was a little bit more amorphous and blobby and it had some charcoal sort of diving into weird spots. Um, so. So we did find the planting hole and the tree hole, which are neat because it can tell us a lot about landscape and the enslaved workforce that um, was able to, or that, that implemented that landscape. Uh, next slide. So people always ask us, what do you find? And usually they're, they're wondering about the artifacts that we've found. Um, and we, we were surprised that we found more than we thought we would. Um, so we shovel tested this area back in 2009 um, so we did a systematic survey across this area as part of our larger plantation survey, which Derek is going to talk about in a little bit. Um, it's a goal just to systematically um, uh, use shovel tests and use archaeology to, um, to see what's, what's on the Monticello plantation. Um, so we dug small holes at uh, 40 and then 20 foot intervals. And we found a not insignificant amount of artifacts, um, but when we came back and dug these larger five foot by five foot test squares, we found lots more artifacts. Um, so we found evidence of slag. So this, this would have been the byproduct of uh, making coal and the coal sheds are located right downhill um, from this site. We found pieces of creamware. So this was a ceramic that was produced between 1760 and 1820. Um, lots of little pieces, so possibly a, a, an object, a plate. Um, they're pretty flat, so it might have been part of a plate. It was broken on Mulberry Row, and perhaps somebody brought it down and threw it away in this area. Um, we also found um, uh, a stoneware, random pieces, nothing to nearly complete, make a complete vessel. We found window glass. You can see that in the bottom left of that dust paint, or window glass at the bottom right, the clear glass. Wine bottle glass is the bottom left. Um, and we found a couple of buttons. We found a copper alloy button. Um, there's Abe's hand in the top left holding one of those buttons. So the size of it tells us it probably would have been for um, maybe a coat or a shirt. Um, probably a, a, a man wore this, this button at some point and either dropped it as um, this person was getting water from the North Spring or um, lost it, um, you know, uh, accidentally. So. Um, based on the quantity of these artifacts, um, it, it's relatively few artifacts for, um, for a site. So we don't think that there would have been any sort of structure here, certainly no domestic occupation. We think that's, that this area just was used as a midden, um, a trash midden for based on the light scatter of artifacts that we have. Um, and I think we have one more slide showing some of the nails that we recovered. Um, from this site. Yeah, so we, um, so this dustpan is showing, and on the top, there's a piece of, a long piece of nail rod. So this um, possibly is from the nailery, which is just up slope from, um, from the North Spring, one in 10 road. Um, so the nailery is up and running by 1794. There's young enslaved men working here. Um, Jefferson is ordering nail rod bundles from, um, from cities like Philadelphia, and it's having them shipped to Monticello, where enslaved workers are then using that to, uh, to make nails. Um, we have some wrought nails from the site, and those are in the bottom right. Um, we have more than this. This is just a small sample. And then we have cut nails from the site, which are produced a little bit later than wrought nails. And they're in the uh, bottom left in that dustpan image. Um, so, so yeah, we didn't end up finding the road, but we, we actually learned you know, a good amount about the landscape in that area. Um, we can confirm that you know there's no set, no building in that area, um, and that our shovel test pit survey sort of um, yeah told the story of what was in in the area. Um, but the the um, what the shovel pet tests don't catch are those larger landscaping features like the planting holes and and the tree holes. So um, so we will. Uh, th this live stream is really about the um, the field work, but lab work is also a really important component. 
Um, so our lab analyst uh, will be working, Krista Vine will be working to process those artifacts, working with students throughout the summer and interns and volunteers. Um, for every one month of field work you spend in the um, outside, it takes about three months of lab work to process all those artifacts. So archaeology is not just being out in the field, it's um, doing all the documentary research that Derek did beforehand and then um, doing the field work, um, which is what our team um, spent the last month and a half doing, and then doing uh, the lab work and all the analysis that, that takes place sort of behind the scenes. I think that wraps up the North Spring. Yep. Yeah, and that brings us to our second initiative this year, which just started last Monday, and that is to systematically explore a an archaeological site that dates to the late 18th century, most likely um, is a field quarter for enslaved field hands. And uh, this, uh, this particular site has never been mentioned on any Jefferson documents. If we go to the next slide, we will see, uh, this is a map that Jefferson made, produced it with his own hand. It's a map of Monticello Mountain. So it's the, uh, it's about a quarter of what was the actively managed farm at Monticello during the during Jefferson's lifetime here. So it's uh, about probably about 600 to 700 acres in size. And uh, if you look at it, it's bounded on the north by the Rivanna River and on the south by the Meadow Branch. I have both of those labeled top, middle top and middle bottom. And, the, and you can kind of see the black squiggly lines. Those are various roads. I have two of them marked, or a number of them marked, fourth roundabout, the farm road, as well as the north road. And um, it, but one thing it's severely lacking in is places where people are living. And in fact, if you look closely where I say mansion house, it doesn't even show the house, the mansion house on this particular map. Uh, but it does show two houses. Um, they are are circled on the map for easier uh, visualization. One says overseer's house below it because Jefferson noted that it was an overseer's house. Uh, there are these uh, sites are marked by just simple little boxes on the map. And there's a second box that's unlabeled uh, that's pretty much in the dead center of the map. And this was also known from Jefferson documents to have been an overseer's house in the late 1790s. Uh, this map was made at the end, right around 1809 or so. So the current, the one that's marked overseer's house was the one that was currently being occup occupied by an overseer, but the other one was uh, where the overseer had lived a decade before. So those are the only two sites uh, in the agricultural fields, which is pretty much everything on the right half of this map um, showing where people were living. So if we, just relied on Jefferson's documents, even if we relied on his surveys that produced that went were done to produce these maps, we wouldn't know more more than maybe five or six places where people were living on on the mountaintop besides Mulberry Row and the mansion house. However, so how does archaeologists go about in finding these sites? Well, if we go to the next slide, uh, Crystal alluded to that um, with the plantation survey, the Monticello Plantation Archaeological Survey, is a systematic survey to cover the entirety of the land that Mon the foundation currently owns that Jefferson once owned in, during his lifetime. And that's why we use uh, uh, surveying equipment. Here is Crystal behind a total station. And we lay out, as she mentioned, we lay out a 40-foot grid across the mountain and we, have, we use a prism to determine the exact location for each one of these shovel test pits. That information is recorded and stored um, and then integrated into our maps of the mountaintop. And on the next slide, we see what is a shovel test pit. Crystal mentioned briefly that it's a hole that's dug. It's generally a foot in diameter, or it is a foot in diameter, and generally a foot deep. However, there are certain places where there's been an accumulation of sediment, such as on the top left image, where, which is in front of the, uh, the mansion house, where there's been a lot of leveling and fill. I think we, how far did we dig? Three plus feet mm -hmm, there? Mm -hmm. Three plus feet mm -hmm. there, and we never reached what we consider undisturbed soil, subsoil. Uh, we just, that's about as long as a shovel, deep of a hole as a shovel can get, and so we had to stop. 
Uh, in other areas, uh, most of the areas, including the agricultural fields, generally a foot would be, get you to undisturbed soil. And it's generally a foot deep, not because of age, not, it's not because 200, over 200 years, a foot of soil is accumulated, but generally all of the mountain has been plowed at some point or another. So the depth of the plow determines how deep you have to dig in most, in most cases. So we do that, dig that uh, shovel test bed every 40 feet. When we encounter artifacts, we drop the interval down to 20 feet until we get a complete ring of negative shovel test pits or no artifacts. Um, so we see here people digging the pit and then we put it into a sifter, which is that screen that the person on the top image on the right is holding. You sift the soil looking for artifacts, anything you find, you uh, bag and take back to the lab as Crystal mentioned. So with that said, let's go to the next slide. We have not found just two sites on Monticello, but dozens. And, uh, and you can see if, if this image comes across well on the live stream, you can see lots of tiny little black dots. You obviously can see the red circles and the blue circles, but there's little tiny dots interspersed across the whole map. And those are each one of our shovel test pits. I think in this particular map, there's 16,000 of these shovel test pits. And we have found, as I mentioned, a couple dozen sites and that date to Jefferson's lifetime. We have also found uh, sites that post-date Jefferson's lifetime as well as predates. There is um, a, a scatter of Native, of Native American presence for, from thousands of years ago up until European arrival in the Piedmont area of Virginia. Uh, so, uh, currently our research is site 30. That's a blue circle kind of right in the middle. If it's having a hard time finding it, if you look limits of survey in the middle section, just go straight up from the S and survey and you'll see the blue circle with site 30. So we found this particular site, not from documents, but from this systematic survey. And, uh, let's see, let's go to the next slide and. And yes, Crystal. So some of the artifacts that um, that we found during the shovel test pit survey, I think um, around site 30, it was shovel tested in 2005. Um, so I wasn't here then, but Derek was actually on the survey. So some of the artifacts that they found um, are in this dustpan image. Um, we, we date sites using ceramics. Um, and so the top right artifact in that uh, dustpan, it's a piece of creamware, which is a nice early date of occupation for Monticello. Um, we have a piece of wine bottle glass in the lower right. There's a, a small piece of white cell clay stoneware in the middle. So that ceramic was produced between 1720 and 1805. So it aligns nicely with the production of creamware. And then Derek mentioned a couple of Native American sites. And at site 30, um, we do have two pieces of pottery of um, Native American ceramics. They're on the left-hand side of the dustpan. I think we have five five pieces total, which is a pretty high concentration for, for us at Monticello um, to be all in one area. Um, it's, it's pretty unusual for us to find those objects. So um, we're going to explore more of that this summer. Um, we're excited to see, um, yeah, what the, what the bigger five-foot by five foot test units hold. So this dustpan is showing artifacts from 2005. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll start to get into our current, current work and current research. So this summer, um, we're doing our Monticello UVA archeology span field school here. We have 10 students who have come to us from all over the country um, and in Ontario too, uh, with some folks from California and um, Texas and right here in Charlottesville, um, right down the road at UVA. Um, so we're excited to have them and to learn more about this site. Um, they come to learn how to do archaeology and and this and how to do public archaeology um, and how to interpret these sites to the public. So students learn how to um, excavate. They learn sort of um, they learn how to draw. They learn how to identify artifacts. We've already learned um, some broad trends within Chesapeake history um, and and why Monticello is important. Um, for this period in history um, and, and why Site 30 matters in that narrative and how the people, how the enslaved people who lived here um, work into that story too. So this was a site where um, agricultural, enslaved agricultural workers would have lived. Um, they probably would have been farming tobacco fields since the site dates earlier. We know that the main crop at Monticello um, during the first half of Jefferson's, of Jefferson's ownership um, of the property was tobacco. 
He later switches to wheat in the 1790s because of a number of factors, but this would have been, um, again, a site during the tobacco period. Um, so next slide. So what are we finding? Um, we've only opened up three test squares so far at this point. Throughout the course of the summer, we're hoping to excavate about 15, um, depending on how, um, how dry the summer is and if we don't get a lot of rain and how quickly we're able to move along. Um, our, our dirt has a lot of clay in it, like I mentioned before, so, so it is slow going. Um, and this site is a plow zone site, so there's no remaining um, really stratified uh, deposit. So we really can use a shovel um, and later a trowel to remove most of the, of the dirt, most of the plow zone to get down to that subsoil layer where we might find things like, um, like features for, um, for fences or for subfloor pits, which are um, uh, storage areas where people would have, where enslaved people would have put root, uh, root vegetables into for the winter. Um, so there's no foundations that we're looking for. These structures would have been put just right on top of the ground. Um, the only way that we can find that these structures exist is through the archaeology and through um, the artifact concentrations. Like Derek said, the site doesn't show up on any of Jefferson's documents. So the archaeology is, is truly the only way that we can um, to get to the people who lived here. Um, so the artifacts that we have been finding throughout the past week and a half include another really nice piece of white salt glaze stoneware um, Vaughn is holding in the upper left. It's a rim piece and it's um, banded based on the um, sort of circumference, the projected circumference of this vessel. So we know it's a hollow vessel. It may, or, or early guesses is it might have been maybe a punch bowl, so a, a pretty big vessel, not a small drinking vessel. Um, so it's interesting that that's showing up on this site. Um, in the lower right, Macy is holding um, a dustpan that includes nails. So nails are a really good indication that there's a building. Um, there are additional pieces of creamware, there's some stoneware, um, and there's brick daub, uh, or, or the, the clay that would have hardened um, to either go between the logs of the cabin or possibly part of a chimney or a hearth. Um, so we're, we're excited to continue exploring this site and to learn how it fits into the larger um, narratives here at Monticello. We've excavated a contemporary site, um, Site 8, for um, a little over a decade. Um, and we, we just wrapped up um, Site 6, which is a site um, that dates a little later than this current site. Um, so we're just interested to see how Site 30 fits into these sites that are nearby and how um, the, the artifact assemblages are similar or different. Um, we have some really fun, great hypotheses about um, social inequality at these sites, um, things that you can't really get to in the documentary record. So um, we have some of that information on our social media. We have written some blog posts about it. Um, you can join us for some of our walking tours um, Monday through Friday. They start at 1.30. Um, they are included with your daily pass. Um, they, so they'll be going to until mid July, if not the end of July. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, let's check if there's any questions. Um, anything else? I had, I had one quick question. Uh, you mentioned at the North Road, uh, one and 10 road, that the artifacts we found were part of a midden and no one was living there. Was where we're finding the artifacts at site 30, mm -hmm. is that where people were living or were they throwing their trash right. there, where, where the artifacts are being found? That's a good question. Um, so the, the types of artifacts matter um, and the volume of artifacts matter. So we're finding a lot more nails at site 30, um, some of which have been pulled, some of which have been uh, so uh, pulled out of a structure. So they kind of have this like, C shape. Um, we have some, um, I'm trying to think if we have window glass. Window glass is also a really good indication of a structure. I don't think we have any from site 30 right now. Um, yeah, so I think the volume of artifacts is kind of telling us that this is um, a site. The, uh, the volume of, of the brick brick daub is also telling us that it's a site. Usually we only, when we find brick and small pieces of brick, it's a good indication that a building would have been nearby. So we have that at site 30, but not at the North Spring. And places like site six, where you mentioned we have excavated a lot, mm -hmm. we have found that uh, 
yeah, the enslaved field hands that were living there were tossing the larger items, the sharp items, a little bit further from where their structures were, whereas right up next to the house, you only find the little tiny things that might either were not dangerous or just were missed during cleanup. Mm -hmm. So generally in most sites, the where you find the artifacts is where people were living. And it's not just the enslaved field hands that were doing this. Everybody uh, at that time was tossing things not far from their front door or from their front window. In fact, we're, we're sitting right next, very close to where Jefferson's bedroom was. And I got the chance to dig there many years ago, right outside the window. And we found one of his toothbrushes and a saucer that clearly broke and he just brushed it out the window. And we found most of those artifacts uh, in this planting feature. So everybody was throwing out the window, out the door. And, and so it, most of the time, it's not until the later 19th century that you get these specific places that people were throwing their trash away. Mm -hmm. Um, so David has a question for us. Monticello seems so neat and tidy today. How messy was it really? People, workers, etc. Um, I think it would have been a pretty uh, smelly, dirty <laughs> um, place to live. Um, animals wandering around. I mean, probably not within the sort of formal precinct mm -hmm. because the haha is sort of keeping larger animals like livestock out. But um, yeah, bathing habits were different. Um, the toothbrush is around, but not for everybody. So ideas of cleanliness are just very different than they yeah. are today. And if you think about it, the vast majority of Jefferson's lifetime, there was some kind of construction going on up here at the mountaintop. So that meant dozens of workers, free and enslaved, working on the house uh, in the same house that you're trying to live in. So it was a extremely busy place. Jefferson also had on Mulberry Row as Crystal mentioned, the nailery, uh, thousands of nails being made a day, a joiner shop to do the woodwork for the house, um, dozens of other people who worked in and around the house, the kitchens living here. So it would have been a very busy and as Crystal said, smelly place. Mm -hmm. um, David has another question. What were the roads uh, paved with? And did we find any evidence of that pavement? Um, so at the North Spring 1 in 10, I, we don't think there is evidence for any sort of paving going on. Um, we did do some rock size sorting, um, which sort of used gradated um, sieves to, to put rocks in to see if you can find any patterns in their spatial distribution. Um, and, and so doing it there would sort of allow us to find out if the spots where we were digging had higher concentrations of rocks, for instance, or cobbles. Um, we really didn't see that big of a difference based on where we were excavating. Um, other, other roads at Monticello we know are more formally, not paved, but they have more of a prepared surface. Um, so the kitchen path going down through the kitchen yard had big greenstone cobbles that were laid flat on a, um, right on top of subsoil. And then Mulberry Row would have had not as large cobbles, but, um, smaller rocks, which, um, were again put right on top of, of uh, red clay or, or subsoil. Can you think of any other roads? That... Uh, no, but, uh, but Jefferson did note at certain times on how quickly enslaved field hands built roads. And it was clear that they were just kind of clearing the land and maybe vaguely leveling the land. Uh, Jefferson would talk about a single field hand building 25 yards of road in a day and this is a 10 foot wide road. So it's a huge area. One could not be hauling in rock and creating a level path. So it's most likely, it's most likely, as Crystal said, roads that were built quickly, but then amended or somehow stabilized through time to uh, try to make the surface a little bit more traversable. And our last question from Natalia, uh, when you dig, do you have an idea of what you're going to find or is it always a surprise factor? Um, that's a great question. Um, it, it's usually a surprise factor. I mean, the pieces of white salt clay stoneware, the Native American ceramics are always just, um, they sort of take your breath away a little bit, especially the large sizes. I mean, we just don't find big pieces like that. So just last week, I mean, I was getting goosebumps, especially because the last people to have held those um, you know, objects, at least the white sulclase stoneware with an enslaved person um, here at Monticello. So, 
yeah, I, I feel like every day you're not really sure what you're going to find. Um, you can sort of kind of sort of know, you know, if you're going to find a lot of artifacts or not a lot. But um, yeah, and it's always ex exciting to find artifacts. It's always exciting to find out about an area too. Yeah, I would say the one in 10 road excavation, I would have I would have almost guaranteed that we would have found some evidence mm -hmm. of some kind of prepared or cut road cut, wagon ruts, something. And we just didn't realize that the area had been plowed as much as it had because it is fairly close to the mansion house. It just shows that, yes, you have to dig in order to figure things out. All right, well, I think that wraps up our um, live stream. So thanks for joining us. Um, and if um, the live stream, the next live stream will be this Saturday for our Ascendant program. So it's a celebration of Juneteenth. We'd love to have you join us either in person or, um, or on live stream online. Um, so you can check out more information on our website or on social media. So thanks a lot. Thank you.